jumping in and out. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, assuming, okay, we can see everyone. I think everything's looking all right here. I managed to, I did a uh, quick tutorial with Ron Paulus last night to make sure we got the whole setup uh, correct. Uh, welcome to the March the 1st uh, meeting of the Bowmanville Rotary Club 2022. Uh, restrictions uh, very quickly going away. Um, so welcome everyone, both online and, uh, uh, and here. Uh, I think the, our only guest today is Paul, correct, our speaker? No, we have two, we have a second one, second half. Oh, oh right but, now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so we only have one guest at the moment. Paul, you'll have a more, more fulsome introduction uh, momentarily. Uh, so with that, I'm, I forgot how to run a meeting. <laughs> totally put it out of my head. Okay, invocation. I think, Rachel, it's up to you now, right? It is. All right, I forgot about that. Let us come together with love and acceptance and always remember what brought us to Rotary. May we always lift each other up and celebrate each other's wonderful attributes. May we use the four-way test as a reminder to ourselves on how to live and not how to, as a tool to judge others. May we always come together with the purpose of spreading peace and love. Thank you. Rachel, that was excellent. Okay, and uh, here I am without uh, a written version of the land acknowledgement in front of me, but I'm going to wing it. I think they'll come pretty darn close. Uh, here in Bowmanville, uh, we are privileged to sit on the land, the traditional lands of the Mississauga of the First Nations, uh, or sorry, Mississauga uh, First Nations. Uh, we thank them for uh, their stewardship of the land and what they've uh, taught us all about uh, about their heritage. Uh, thank you. Um, Pauline, birthdays and anniversaries. Do we have any? Yes, we do. It's a day to celebrate because it's St. David's Day, patron saint of the land of the leeks and the daffodils. So that's a special day. Um, Birthdays, Lisa, Lisa Tamlin, are you on there? Yeah. Hey, Lisa, happy birthday happy on March birthday. 6th. Yeah. Thank you. There's no wedding anniversaries. Service above cell, this broad called Pauline Calvert was inducted 30 years ago today. <laughs> this guy called Stephen Kay was inducted seven years ago on March the 3rd. Oh, Jennifer Foley, four years ago, March 6th. Joe Salve, also four years ago, on March 6th. And Gail Nyberg, three years ago, on March 12th. And I, I'm going to start off. I've got 50 happy bucks. That's for my 30 years in Rotary. And $10 for bringing in my husband. And another $10 for bringing in my daughter. <laughs> oh, my. Wowee. Okay, I'm going to uh, just Lisa. Uh, since it's St. David's Day and uh, your husband is Dave, uh, do you celebrate his name day on your birthday as well? Um, I know <laughs> it must be hard. Um, okay, I'm going to do announcements first because uh, I'm going to have to uh, skip back to start up a, uh, a work call in the middle here. Uh, we've got a few announcements. Um, let's see. Uh, first off, we've got uh, Rhonda Gorm, the coldest night of the year, uh, uh, for the walk last week, raised $325. Yeah, uh, fantastic. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, received an email from uh, Steve Rutledge about uh, filtration uh, systems. Let's, uh, I'll read it out to you here. We did it. Despite the terrible weather uh, during what is supposed to be the dry season, we were able to distribute the remaining 300 plus water filters in Northern Laos. This makes a total of eight villages served this season with a water filter for every family. Bandalong is a village of 42 families uh, and the tribes of 
Kamu and Lao, uh, all families for uh, farm for a living, but also fish. Since we first built uh, a school there in 2012, 2013, there's been a road built so you can get there by truck instead of by boat. What a blessing. Imagine having a load, uh, uh, having to load all the school uh, construction material by boat. The village is about 181 kilometers from our base in Luang Prabang. Pronunciation not uh, counting. Uh, please accept our apologies if any uh, pictures are blurry. Um, we'll make sure the pictures are sent out to you rather than me trying to uh, share them on the screen. Um, but there's pictures of uh, coordination, trans uh, transportation, packing, unpacking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's that. Congratulations to uh, Steve and everyone involved. So Steve uh, K, quickly. Yeah. Yep. That was the picture that he sent is actually the one that the Bowmanville Rotary Club donated in memory of his father. Oh, okay. Well, I'll try and get that up quickly uh, uh, before the end of the meeting. That's lovely. Okay, uh, next board meeting is next Wednesday, uh, location to be determined, but it'll be seven o'clock uh, Wednesday. Um, we do have another announcement while I make my way around here. Um, another Steve Rutledge announcement. Uh, I sent an email out the other day, Whippy Sunrise is, uh, is doing a maple syrup uh, fundraiser. All the information is in there. Please give a call or send Steve an email if you're interested in purchasing any, uh, any maple syrup. Um, and finally, before I uh, turn things over to Joe to introduce the speaker, um, the club received a uh, lovely card uh, from Carol Ridley. Um, Bowmanville Rotary Friends, Wayne really loved all of you kind people, and I can't thank you enough for your, your kindness, Carol Ridley. The flowers were lovely. Many thanks, you kind people. From uh, Carol. Okay. <clears throat> And with that, I'll leave it to Joe to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Kind of weird because when you sit there, you don't wear a mask because you're drinking coffee. And then when you come up here, you get your mask on and no one can hear what you're saying. So um, thanks, Steve. Uh, since I've joined Rotary, I have met a lot of people from uh, clubs all across our district. One of the things that uh, most of us have in common, besides a service of ourselves, is the challenge of growing our clubs by adding new members. Uh, recently, I attended a grow, a grow Rotary workshop where the guest speaker told us how his club has been able to grow even during the pandemic uh, with some numbers that uh, really, frankly, blew me away. His name is Paul Elsley. Uh, he's a retired high school teacher who, among other things, started a charity, and I'm getting all clogged up here, a charity that feeds children in need on weekends. He is a Rotary area governor, past president of the Rotary Club of Kingston, and I invited him to share his story of how he grew his club with us this morning. Thanks, Paul. Take it away. I realize I have to unmute myself before I share the screen. <laughs> Here we go. Thanks very much, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys today and, uh, and tell you a little about our story in Kingston. Um, the story begins four years ago uh, when we began planning for our centennial, which happened in 2021. But uh, there were some bumps and twists all along the way, um, which I'll share with you today. But um, let me begin by saying that what's happened to our club is pretty extraordinary. We're at 82 members right now with 24 honorary members. And as you can see, we're just down the road from you guys in District 7040. Um, as I said, we began planning for our centennial uh, four years ago, and that really was the driving force for our membership growth, which was unparalleled in our club. Like many clubs in North America, we had been shrinking uh, for probably the last 20 years. We went from a high of 140 down into the mid-50s two years ago, uh, but that all changed during our centennial year. So that's just a little about me. Um, I, I was president during the centennial year, which was, um, it was a lot of fun to be president at that time. There was so much going on in our club in spite of the pandemic. And subsequently I've moved on to get involved in a number of things at the district level uh, over the last two years. 
So here we are back in March of 2020, getting ready for our centennial. And then uh, I come back from Florida with my family to discover that all heck has broken loose. And um, I think all Rotary clubs at that point in time decided to hunker down out of an abundance of caution, not sure what was happening and, and certainly uh, very concerned for their own health and well-being. Yet, it was very clear to me, because of my work with my not-for-profit feeding kids on the weekends, that community needs exploded in those first few months. Lots of people lost their jobs. There were some significant mental health issues that increased. Uh, businesses obviously struggling as they shut down or laid off employees. And governments and other agencies were in emergency mode. And so it was clear to me there was a huge gap in need and that's why it was so important for service organizations like rotary not to sit on the sidelines but to become quickly engaged in helping to support the community during the pandemic and in my case uh, we fed the kids out of schools and um, and when the schools closed all of a sudden there was a huge number of kids who were usually being fed in school breakfast lunch and a snack each day who now did not have access to that so we had to figure out a way to make that happen. So we very quickly pivoted. You see me here at the food sharing project, putting together boxes of food. We uh, were feeding 550 families and 1,500 children every week for almost 20 months. Um, oh. Typically, we would have fewer families than that, but as I say, the pandemic increased the number of people who needed this kind of support. You know, the, what, what I would call uh, the folks whose hours had been cut back at work or perhaps had uh, been dislocated from their jobs. And so we had a massive rotary effort, about 60 volunteers who were phoning families who were picking up the food from uh, some of which was rescued from organizations like Costco and Finley Foods, and Cobb's Bakery. Uh, they were about to throw it out and we decided to repurpose it instead. And um, we had people actually driving the food boxes to homes, um, packing the food boxes. So about 60 Rotarians who got behind this effort. One of the other things we decided to do, because a number of the families told us that they didn't have the disposable income to go out and buy a bunch of masks for the kids. And so we decided to get into mask production. And one of the silver linings we found was that um, in addition to producing them for the, the families that we were serving, there were lots of Rotary clubs around who wanted access to our masks and offered us uh, significant chunks of money as a donation in order for us to get them. So we produced a few thousand masks and uh, lo and behold, we ended up raising $7,500. And as you know, it's been extremely difficult to raise money during the, the pandemic. A lot of traditional fundraisers have been put on hold. And so you have to come up with some inventive ways to raise funds. Um, while this is going on, uh, word was beginning to spread throughout the community. And I don't know how aware your community is of, of Rotary and what Rotary does. But it became very clear that there was a new appreciation for what Rotary does as a result of our pandemic efforts. And so lots of people started reaching out to us. So public health reached out and said, can you guys lead the volunteer effort at our mass vaccination clinic at the Invista Center? We said, of course we can. Then uh, the Chamber of Commerce reached out and said, can Rotary lead the volunteer effort to get rapid test kits out to businesses? And we said, absolutely. And uh, then there was uh, a desire to build a new community food warehouse where all this rescued food would go before heading out into other food organizations and, and to get to, to families. And we were asked to be part of the organization team and we ended up raising $30,000. Uh, Rotarians raised $30,000 toward the purchase of some of the capital equipment that was necessary. We were invited to be on the mayor's uh, pandemic task force. We were invited to have a seat on the food security uh, network that was established in the city. Everybody became very aware uh, that we were engaged. We were determined to help in whatever way we could. And uh, I guess the piece I hadn't told you, it's not just our club. We've got six clubs in Kingston. And this is all of the clubs working together uh, in order to get these jobs done. 
But we, you know, we had put our centennial on hold basically when the pandemic hit, um, in no mood to celebrate and uh, not quite sure what direction we were going to go. But here are the centennial goals that we established four years ago. We wanted to enhance collaboration amongst the clubs, expand the profile of Rotary in Kingston, raise a lot of money to fund the projects that we had planned for our centennial increased membership in all of the clubs in Kingston. Those were some pretty lofty goals, especially given the 20 year um, direction we had had with respect to membership going the wrong way. I'll quickly highlight uh, the first three goals, but I wanna focus most of my attention on membership for you. So in terms of collaboration, um, the first thing we did four years ago was to say, we don't wanna celebrate the centennial of our club. We wanna celebrate a hundred years of Rotary in Kingston. All of the other clubs are children of our club, if you will. Uh, we sponsored them all. And so we invited them all to participate and they, uh, they jumped at the opportunity. And so we had each of the clubs represented in our centennial planning committee. And for each of the projects, we tried to have a member from e at least one member from each of the clubs involved with that project. And so it was a real team effort. Um, in addition to having a president's council, which meets monthly, and it involves the presidents and the presidents elects of the eight clubs, including Gananoque and uh, Napanee based here in Seaway West. Um, we established joint committees as well. So um, youth services, membership, uh, a number of collaborative efforts on the part of the clubs here in Kingston which really, I think, gave us a, a great appreciation uh, for what the other clubs were doing. The communications uh, channels were opened in new ways and we were able to share the labor that was needed for most of the efforts that we were talking about here. We also wanted to strengthen our existing community partnerships and we have many here in Kingston. Um, both the Cataraqui Club and our club run something called the Community Outreach Grants Program. So every year we give out between 20 and $30,000 to smaller organizations in the city. And uh, having done this now for five years, you can imagine we've established a number of partnerships with these organizations. We wanted to strengthen those and uh, to also create some new ones, find some new community partners. Fundraising was gonna be a real challenge. We had uh, planned to have a gala. Uh, our goal was to raise $100,000. Well, no gala, no $100,000, at least from that avenue. We lost our golf tournament. We lost a couple of our other traditional fundraisers. And so what we need to do is find new, uh, new fundraisers like everybody else. Um, and that can happen a couple, of, a couple of different ways. We started reaching out to foundations in the area looking to leverage funding. Uh, we reached out to um, benefactors in the community to tell them our story, to get them to make contributions. I'll, I'll give you one uh, interesting thing. Uh, we had a couple of stories that uh, appeared on television and in the newspaper. And one of our Rotarians lives in a condo downtown in Kingston. And the guy who lives just down from him uh, was chatting with him in, in the elevator or the hallway. I can't remember which. And he was asking Alan about the story and about what we're doing. Uh, the next day, uh, he wakes up in the morning to find a $5,000 check slid under his door. The guy did uh, an additional $5,000 check the next week. Um, and these were completely unsolicited. A lot of stuff like that was happening because we were active and engaged in the community, because uh, lots of stories were getting out. We also found another silver lining that some of our traditional fundraisers that we could continue um, did exceptionally well. So we produce a cash calendar every year. Typically, it would raise $18,000 or so. During, our, uh, during the pandemic, we actually raised $30,000 from the sale of cash calendars last year. And of course, there was lots of generous support. Uh, 40 Rotarians ponied up $1,000 each. And we have lots of friends of Rotary, um, from companies to individuals who are prepared to make significant contributions. We ended up raising, if you combine both our pandemic efforts and our centennial, $700,000 during the pandemic. Pretty amazing. Wow. We wanted to expand the profile of our club and of the other Kingston clubs to really get the name of Rotary out there. And we did that um, 
first of all, by actually taking $10,000 out of our club account. And so imagine our club account is, is where our club dues go to look after our overall operation. So we had a surplus in there of about 30 grand. We took 10 of it and invested it in the production of five one minute videos, including one called Why Join Rotary. Those, those videos got a lot of play on social media. They got a lot of play on television as well. Uh, our local television station has been a tremendous supporter of what Rotary does. And so they were um, at, at no cost to us were prepared to, to uh, show these videos as marketing pieces for us at various points throughout the year. Uh, we really enhanced our presence on social media and we got our community partners to retweet and repost the posts that were going out from our various clubs. And so, you know, thousands of people uh, on, a, on a daily basis or if not daily, certainly every week are getting messages that are coming from our clubs. We also wanted to focus the messaging about Rotary in Kingston. And so we developed a new central website. And so this is the first portal for anybody who wants to find out about Rotary in Kingston. It's a new website at rotaryinkingston.cool. Check it out sometime and you'll see that what we deliver here are what is Rotary? How do you join Rotary? Uh, those kinds of messages that, that are central and consistent amongst all of our clubs. And from that site, you can then go to the other clubs and, uh, to check each of them out. The enhanced media presence, and you see one of our articles, this is the, the, our world champion town crier announcing um, that the city of Kingston is declaring uh, 2021 a year of Rotary in Kingston. We had an article in the local newspaper every single week, beginning uh, in January of 2021, right through the year. Every single week, we had at least one article in the newspaper. So we were getting an awful lot of uh, media presence. And it was an easy thing to do because we have so many good stories to tell, and they're looking for good stories. I'm sure your local newspaper uh, is, is prepared if they're not already doing so to do the same thing. But let's focus on membership. Our goal uh, was to increase membership to reverse the patterns that had been going on for the last 20 years. It was not going to be easy, and it required a sea change in our culture in order to make this happen. Um, it began with a new approach, and that new approach was one in which, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. So a new approach, a successful membership strategy. Uh, we wanted to seek out new types of members and, and, and uh, be a little more creative in, in who we were reaching out to. We wanted to make the induction process something extremely special so that uh, anyone who was inducted into our club felt as though um, they had just been involved in a very special ceremony. And then, of course, there are always people who leave at the end of the year when we ask for dues to be paid uh, for, for the upcoming year. And so what we wanted to do was to come up with a retention plan that reduced the number of people who were leaving our club on an annual basis. The average, just so in case you're not aware, but the average rate of attrition for Rotary clubs in our zone is 15%. That's a pretty high number. So attracting candidates. Uh, we had always waited for people to come to us. Occasionally, somebody might bring somebody to a meeting but there wasn't much of a plan. And uh, so we needed to be proactive. We needed to go out and find good people who we knew would make good Rotarians. We, uh, we have a membership committee. Fortunately, we're big enough uh, to be able to, to have a, a membership committee with a membership chair. There are about 10 people on it, but that has been a central force in mobilizing our efforts to recruit new members. So if you don't have a membership committee, I think you're a big enough group that you certainly could have one. Um, one of the five attributes of clubs who have been growing over the past year or two is, is just that. They all have membership committees. It allows you to, to give more focus and more energy and more resources toward growing your clubs. You want to make sure that you advertise widely and often. We've just finished another social media campaign uh, trying to recruit new members uh, to our club. We added 19 members last year during our centennial, 
And we've carried the momentum through this year. We've already added 11 members, so 30 new members in our club over the past 20 months. Um, we wanted to make our meetings more dynamic, and that was easy to do uh, when we moved online because you could invite speakers from all over the world. Uh, at one point, we even had the RI, uh, the RI president <laughs> as our keynote speaker at a meeting. But there are some fabulous people who can come and speak to your club, and, and it starts there. If you have dynamic meetings, and, and that's the first point of uh, the first touch point for a, a membership candidate, um, you're more likely to attract them as a member than if your member uh, your your meetings are not dynamic. And the other thing that became clear to us was that new folks want service opportunities. They want to get involved in projects. They want to serve their community. They don't just want to come to meetings. And so we have vastly increased the number of service opportunities that are happening uh, at least a couple a month, even during the pandemic. Setting strategies is, is so important. So uh, as you saw, we set, uh, we set centennial goals. We also set annual goals. The membership committee set annual goals. We wanted to try and add 10 new female members to our club. We wanted to try and grow by 15. And we were able to achieve both those things. We wanted to be one of the top three um, clubs in our zone for membership growth. And we ended up being number one. Um, our, our district was number one, and, and, uh, and we were one of the top 5% clubs in North America for growth. So setting goals, I think, keeps, keeps the bar set at a nice high level and keeps you focused. The messaging had to be changed as well. Um, people didn't know uh, that, that you could come to us and join. They thought you had to be invited. Uh, they weren't sure what Rotary did. And so, you know, getting that message out about serving your community building community, some key messaging associated with it. It was a real team effort, not only our membership committee, but the board was heavily engaged. And then individual members started to become so proud of what was going on in our club that they, they started bringing people to, to our meetings. And so we had four or five members that I can recall who brought one or two new people that ended up becoming members. Tap into your district and zone. There are now tremendous resources, and, and I think this is another culture shift that's happened. Uh, rather than telling us what to do, they are now supporting us in our efforts and asking us what, uh, how they can help. There are some tremendous resources out there, so tap into them. And, and then don't be afraid to enlist other groups in, in getting your messages out. Your community partners are more than willing to do it. They're, they're equally proud of what Rotary is doing. Um, new member types. Uh, I, I think you want to look at the classifications you have in your club. Are there any that are missing? We were missing some, some key fundraising people, and so we went out and recruited them. Um, what community organizations are out there that you have affiliations with? Believe it or not, we added nine new community organizations as Rotary members. We reached out to them and said, you can en let's enhance our partnership. There are some real gains that you can make from being close, more closely affiliated with us and, and we with you. We've added uh, three corporate members and uh, one of our clubs here in Kingston has a category called Friends of Rotary. In making the induction, induction special, as I said, the, the new members had a, a tremendous feeling of, of pride at the end of the ceremony. Uh, it started with a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the president. Um, where we made it very clear that we had certain expectations, but we wanted to find out what they wanted to get out of um, joining as well. Um, we have orientation sessions leading up to it. We ask them to do a bit of homework. Uh, and then it's the highlight of the meeting. It's the first thing we do after the invocation. Um, and we get five people, including a new member, involved in the induction ceremony. And then member retention, of course. What I didn't tell you is that while we added 19, we lost five. And uh, we want to try and avoid that wherever we can. And in a couple of cases, it were people that lost jobs and moved out of the area. We had another person who simply switched clubs who stayed in Rotary. But there are always things that you can do to improve. And so what I've listed here are a number of things. I'm going to have to head to the bus station, or bus station to the, the bus stop with my two kids in a moment. So I'm going to shut it down there. 
and uh, hand it over for questions. If there are any, I'll stop sharing. Joe, back to you. You want me to take? Uh, you might as well, Joe. I'll okay. change that. Sure. Any questions? Anybody have any questions from Zoom or here? Um, yeah, I'll have a question. Paul, can you talk a little bit about your relationship with the local media? Because, um, you know, we've, I, I sort of know the local reporters and stuff. It's really hard to break in. How did, what, did you build a relationship? Did they start coming to you, say, what's going on this week? How does that, that work? Well, I imagine that you have, uh, because this is what Rotarians do, Rotarians connect people and they have connections. Uh, I'm sure there's somebody in your club who has connections to the media. You want to take advantage of that. The other thing that you can do is to invite somebody from the media to join your club, and then you'll have a connection. Mm -hmm. um, we, we just, uh, you know, I, I think the key, Joe, was having a lot of good stories to share and being very engaged in the community. If your club is doing that and doing those things, the media is prepared to share those stories. I, I'm sure, I mean, you've got a, a local publication and I, I know it's a big conglomeration that owns all these local uh, uh, newspapers, but um, we were able to take advantage of our actions in the community and our connections within the media network to get these things done. Well, thank you for the inspiration. Um, um, Joe, Andrew has a question. Oh, sorry. Andrew? Yes, Mike, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful update and presentation. My question is really about how you as a club, particularly, have used diversity, equ equity, and inclusion in growing your, your work. Oh, that's a very good question. Um, Let's just say that became a priority uh, as it has with many clubs after our centennial. <laughs> so really it's, it's this past year, we, we've really tried to, to improve that. Now it starts with, in our case, because uh, everybody in our club looks like me, not diverse, at least culturally speaking. Um, but we added, uh, we actually added 11 new female members to our club. So we improved our gender balance in our club from 32% female to 39% female. That's one way we've, we've moved the bar. Um, we also uh, got much younger. So many of the 19 new members are, are quite a bit younger than the rest of us. Our average age before the centennial was 67 and it's dropped a few years now because we've got a number of members who are in their 30s and in their 40s uh, and in their 50s. And so uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion has started there, but it's, it's a, obviously it's a work in progress and um, we need to figure out other ways to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, we have a couple of things we still have to get to. So thank you very much. Um, I hope it was inspirational. It certainly was for me. And uh, we do have a membership committee. And as you, I think you said it when, at the workshop that I attended was that your whole club is the membership committee as well. So everybody. Can get in. And Joe, maybe what I'll do just before I sign off, I'll, uh, I'll send uh, later this morning, I'll, I'll send a bunch of the resources that I've got ready to go. And you can maybe share them with your membership committee. They can have a look at them. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Take care. Of you. We have guests, but we have a couple of times uh, coming. Yeah, yeah, happy but yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say that, but we do have uh, time for some happy bucks. And uh, anybody want to start? <clears throat> I will give. Well, I'll start. I'll, I'll do my thing here. I'll give. Uh, what have I got here? I've got five happy bucks. Um, my daughter, uh, who's moved back home with us after uh, living in Holland for, I think, three, four years now, three years, um, started looking for a job, found one quickly, and uh, is, is going to be moving to Ottawa, which is kind of exciting. She's the job of companies in Toronto, but like so many uh, companies now, uh, you can live wherever you want, and she's going to be living in Ottawa, uh, and, uh, and so she got a job pretty quickly, which was pretty Pretty cool for a 25 year old given things that are happening now. And her immediate boss also lives in Ottawa, which is interesting the way things work. So, um, 
Anybody else have any happy thoughts? Lloyd. Lloyd. I, I think Lloyd is actually Lloyd. Do you have a happy thought? Where did you want to answer? I do real. I do real quick. Uh, both my kids' birthdays are this month. Uh, one turns one, one turns 18. That is worth 18 happy bucks. Oh, isn't that fantastic? Mm -hmm. And I think, Roy, you have, um, you're going to introduce uh, our community report speaker. You better believe I am. <laughs> Good boy. All right. So, <clears throat> listen, I am really, really pleased today to introduce Ian Underwood, uh, the CEO for Habitat for Humanity GTA. Um, Habitat believes everyone deserves a safe place to live. For families in the GTA, the need for a safe home has never been greater. Uh, Habitat for Humanity builds strength, stability, and, uh, and a brighter financial future for families through affordable home ownership. Um, this is not your, uh, your father's habitat. Um, and as you'll hear from Ian, um, they're, they've moved sort of beyond just building single homes to building homes at scale, which is really, really exciting. I've, uh, I've worked with Ian on a number of projects. Uh, I am really inspired by her passion for her work, uh, her focus on affordability and, access and accessibility, especially for people of color and marginalized communities. And, uh, and I'm amazed by her incredible bicycling stamina. Uh, she is a dedicated and impressive cyclist in her spare time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ian Underwood. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I, it, as so Lloyd and uh, Joe and Rotarians, it, it's a um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I, uh, I want to just open by thanking you for what you do as community leaders. Uh, I just think it's a really impressive what the Rotary does. Um, Lloyd, I have a ton of things to say, but I think you yeah. were going to pile on questions at me. Yeah, I just I'm gonna I'm gonna lead us off with a quick question, which is talk to us about the project in Clarendon. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to do so. Now, people may notice I chose to use as my backdrop this morning a satellite view of Clarington. If I step to, well, if I get my right directions going here, uh, yeah, just the, the little dot up in the upper right hand corner is the site of, as you've heard, what will be the first Habitat for Humanity project in Clarington, and it's a big one. Uh, so, that just to situate that for you, that's the north west corner of uh, Baseline and Spry. Uh, this is former municipal land. Uh, what we will be building there uh, is, uh, is in total, uh, I think it's 84 homes. So a brand new subdivision with 84 homes. 32 of those will be Habitat for Humanity homes. And as Lloyd said, our model is a home ownership model. So we are working to give people, working lower income families, both the stability and the adequacy of a home that works for them and the opportunity to take what otherwise would have been rent and turn that into equity. Uh, so building equity, building generational wealth for their family. So 32 of the units will be Habitat. The other 52 units um, will be uh, uh, coming through our partnership with another organization you may have heard of, Durham Region Nonprofit Housing Corporation. And those homes will be uh, seniors uh, rental. Um, uh, so affordable housing aimed at seniors. So we're really excited to be building a much needed mixed income, mixed tenure community um, here in, uh, in Clarington. Um, there is a huge shout out here to give to your local counselor, uh, or sorry, council. So this is a surplus piece of property. Um, Clar Clarington, um, municipality of Clarington put this on the market. We were one of 17 bids for this land uh, and uh, the other 16 being competitive market bids who would have paid more money for it. Um, but the municipality uh, uh, decided that they didn't want to lose the opportunity of using a public asset of land and have that just you know, turn into money today and gone tomorrow. So what they've done by choosing this joint bid of ourselves and Durham Region Nonprofit Housing Corp is they've made a commitment to more affordable housing in Clarington in perpetuity. 
because those seniors' homes will remain affordable uh, in perpetuity, but also a change that we've made in our habitat model, and I can get into it more uh, another day, but is we've rebalanced how the equity is shared between the homeowner and habitat. So in exchange for that opportunity to become a homeowner and start to build equity, um, the equity is shared so that habitat will always be in the position to buy these homes back and keep this affordability uh, going for from one homeowner to the next. So that, and I, I'll maybe Lloyd um, yep. say one more other quick thing. In terms of what will they look like, because that sounds like a lot of housing, they will look, I'll just change my background here really quickly. They'll look something uh, like this. This is a project that we finished in Scarborough a couple years ago. So these will be, uh, in, in the case of Habitat, they'll be three-story, what we call stacked back-to-back -to -back townhomes. In the case of the seniors housing, it will also be three stories um, uh, in a kind of seniors rental format. Um, and I'll make one other quick thing, and Lloyd, Lloyd you really that can jump in. 25, all of these units will be built with what you call universal design, which means they are designed for accessibility. 25% of the units will be built as fully accessible. So, uh, so thanks for that, Ian. I know uh, my local councillor, Ron Hooper, has been a huge, passionate fan of this project too, and, and uh, <clears throat> he's a Rotarian as well. I, uh, quick question for you then. Um, what's, the, uh, what's the definition of affordability? In, uh, from a, because I, I, I hear that term used a lot. What does yeah. that mean for Habitat? Yeah, and I think everyone understands it's changed at a dizzying pace. Um, so uh, let me say a few things. First, let me actually start with some numbers that go with that. Um, in 2010, uh, the average uh, price of a home in Clarington was $248,000. And so you could, the average uh, or the, the um, income level you'd need for a mortgage for that home could be as low as 50,000. At the start of the pandemic, so January, 2020, the average price of a home was 569,000 and you'd need $112,000 of income to qualify, which by the way is well beyond what we think of as a habitat level. And today, uh, anyone wanna guess, anyone looked recently, average price of a home in Clarington? 800. 1.091. No. Uh, so 1.1 million, you need two. $213,000 of income to qualify for, uh, to be a homeowner in Clarington now. And so affordability, and that happened in two years, right? So affordability has changed at a dizzying pace. Uh, so at Habitat, when we talk about affordability, we are aiming now, and I'll just, again, I'll just stick with numbers. We're now aiming at households who are, have a total income of around $75,000 which is a lot higher than we used to. To be, to be clear, $75,000 means it's all of their employment income. So it might be you know, a mom who's working part-time as a hairdresser and a dad who's working full-time as a personal service worker. Their two incomes plus the child tax benefit would get them into that kind of $75,000 plus range. But what we know is coming back to affordability, Affordability is being able to adequately provide for your household, which means you can provide shelter, you can provide food, et cetera. CMHC, um, Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation, sets as a target 32% as the maximum of your household income that you should be spending on shelter in order to afford a place to live. And, and I didn't look uh, at your rates right now, but in Toronto, a $90,000 income gets you a one bedroom apartment right now, if you're staying at an affordability level. So uh, affordability is changing rapidly in our communities. It's dividing our communities. Uh, and so what we are trying to do at Habitat is create these opportunities for people to have a home that works, that is affordable, and in the process, building a more inclusive kind of future for all of us. Well, I think, and I, thanks for that, Ian, and I think that speaks to the need in the community for, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious uh, that this is necessary in our community. Can you talk to me a bit about, you know, where the process goes from here? Like what, what happens next in this project? 
Yeah. So yeah, because coming back to that picture I showed you, you know what what uh, what this wonderful possibility is right now is a piece of grass. And uh, so as you are probably aware, uh, again. <laughs> a challenge in developing anything anywhere, but certainly in this province is it takes a long time to uh, work through the approvals process. So we are um, currently going through what you call due diligence. Um, the expectation is we will be at the uh, community consultation stage next fall, which are sorry, fall of this year, fall 2022. Um, and I'll make sure I let you folks know when that happens, because that's actually a place where you can help by showing up at the community consultation, letting them know that you are supportive of this, et cetera. Uh, the, the actual construction of the project will likely start, or we hope it will start in 2023. Um, and uh, uh, it's possible it won't, will take until 2024, but hopefully by the end of 2023, we're under construction. Um, and with luck, uh, hopefully that means uh, people are starting to move into these homes in late 2024, uh, 2025 for sure, but hopefully 2024. And by the way, I know those timelines sound crazy that it takes that long to take a piece of grass and turn it into opportunity. Um, but um, Canada ranks 34th out of 35 OECD countries on how long it takes to uh, get land approved. Right. Uh, so bigger conversation for another day. So um, <clears throat> last question for you, then, Ian. What can we do? Like, what? how can Rotary support this? Yeah, thank you. Uh, again, thank you for having me and thank you for asking. Um, so there's a number of ways you can help. As I said, the um, uh, for this project, the uh, I'd say an immediate thing you could do is I think it'd be fantastic for Rotary to send a letter to uh, municipality of Clarington, letting them know um, how much you support their choice of this kind of development. So there's number one, kind of an immediate thing you can do. As I said, we'll let you know when the community consultations are um, because it's really helpful for people to show up and say, this is a good thing to do. Um, then of course, uh, there's volunteering and um, uh, uh, we have, uh, and so we're really hopeful that you'll come out and help us build when we're here. But I would also say, if you are thinking, I don't want to wait that long, uh, this is our build site in uh, Oshawa this morning. Um, and uh, we would love to have you uh, kind of drive across the border or encourage other people you know, come and help us build right now in Oshawa. We have 50 homes underway in Oshawa, um, just off of... Um, uh, just off of Regional Road 14. So this is, uh, uh, and you can come and volunteer there. Uh, similarly, volunteering at our, our store at, in Oshawa at the Midtown Mall. Um, and then when we get closer to this project, again, we'd love to have you volunteering. Um, it would be fantastic if you are, um, you can help a bit on fundraising and just raising awareness of this. Um, this project will be a 15 or $16 million project for the Habitat Park to build those 32 homes. The seniors are largely paid through government funding, but the Habitat Homes, as you know, we're a, we're a charitable model. The biggest source of the funding comes from the family mortgages. That will pay for about half of it. We will get some government funding, um, but we will likely need to be raising in the order of three to four million dollars to finish those homes. So just, you know, whatever you might be able to do to help us introduce us to people in the community who might want to support that, support it. Those are, that gives you the range of ways um, that Rotary can really help us. Amazing. Thanks, Ian. Um, we have, do we have time for a QA and a or how are we doing for time, folks? Yeah, I think we got, sure, I guess I'll do this, yeah. Um, yeah, we got about five minutes, I guess. Um, and I have a question for you, um, I'm the kind of guy who, um, uh, I know we have a lot of really skilled people here um, in terms of construction and helping out, but I'm the kind of guy who like bangs his finger with a hammer. And when I use it, what, what kind of expertise do you need to volunteer to help out on one of your projects? Uh, so to volunteer on the build site or in our stores, uh, uh, no expertise uh, is needed. So just kind of a, a availability of time and willingness to uh, come and help out. Um, and I'll go specifically with the build sites. We'll provide you with all of your safety equipment, with safety boots, hard hats, safety glasses, gloves, etc. cetera. Um, some people do come and they just try it out for a day and say, ah, it's not really my thing. Um, we have some people who are at the build site three days a week. 
We have some people who have come with a lot of experience and some people have come with no experience. Uh, we actually, we have one uh, volunteer who came, uh, he took semi-retirement, wanted to try out Habitat, came, started coming really often and actually trained to become a Red Seal carpenter as a result of his experience on our site. And we don't get him much as a volunteer anymore because he started his own home renovation business from the skills he, he developed at the site. So it, it, it certainly, you can come with, uh, with no skills. That's part of the beauty of Habitat. Um, the, I will say the volunteers who are golden to us are the ones who are kind of, you know, who are saying, yeah, I wanna come one day a week or two days a week or whatever, or every other <coughs> Saturday, so that you're getting used to the build site and being able to help out. And if it's of interest to you, then also becoming what we call a crew leader of overseeing and the directing the work of other volunteers. And if a bunch of us wanted to come, I don't know, organize a group, like five or six or however many people wanted to come, like for an afternoon or something, would that be okay? Um, it is. It is something that we have changed at Habitat. Um, as you can imagine, as much as volunteering is really important to us, um, now it also just costs an awful lot of money to build these homes. And we, as you can imagine, have a lot of folks who would like to come. So uh, uh, what, what we do now, certainly with corporate groups, is we do charge for the build days so that the, there's a volunteer component, but we're also getting money for the actual bricks and mortar materials paying the trades for when we need them, et cetera. Um, and uh, we'll have to figure out exactly what we're doing in Clarington at that build, because we know that um, you're farther away from the big population. So we're not sure if, if we'll find we're, quote, selling all the build days, um, or if we're making some of them what we call community build days, where it is a group of people saying, hey, we're willing to give our time and help you build. So that's kind of a, I know that's an, a little bit of an ambiguous answer, um, but, uh, but certainly it's something that, that we can follow up and talk about. And if you want to organize a build, like if you're saying we don't want to wait till 2024, we want to build this summer, let us know and we'll see if we can organize something at the site behind me uh, at no, what we call Normandy in Oshawa. Andrew, you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, thank you again for the wonderful work you do. I wanted just to find out from you what motivated you to be, you know, to do the work that you do. Uh, we haven't had much about that so far. What made you be a part of uh, Habitat? Um, Andrew, thank you for asking. Um, uh, I grew up as the youngest of a family of uh, five children, a uh, farm family in southwest Ontario, um, who I, and I realized when I was a bit older, a family where it was two parents really struggling to keep the farm together. Um, when I was four years old, our barn burnt. Um, I remember that really vividly. I was there in my mother's arms on a warm summer evening watching the barn burn. Um, and as a four-year-old, I had no appreciation of what that meant, how devastating that was for my parents. But I do remember um, eight or nine or eight months later, um, this shiny new barn that had been rebuilt. Um, and before it was used, my parents hosted a barn dance. So they had this like big party with, you know, square dancing uh, and, you know, ladies, please bring lunch is the way it used to be referred to. Kids running wild everywhere. All our extended family, neighbors, friends were there. And my parents who were kind of stoic people and who uh, we never saw being emotional at one point stood up and thanked friends and family for helping them rebuild. And while as a four-year-old, I really didn't understand what all this was about, I knew it was something important. And so to be honest, kind of year, decades later, when this opportunity came along and Habitat, which is all about, you know, just neighbors and communities rallying around people who for whatever reason and circumstances have had something happen that's holding them back. Um, uh, uh, you know, Habitat is, is, is the embodiment of that, that says, you know, how can we just help each other? Um, and, you know, in the case of our farm family, um, all five of those kids, of which I'm one, went on to go to university. The uh, farm now is actually one of Ontario's larger uh, farms. Uh, uh, it employs a number of people. It feeds thousands of people in Canada and the Pacific Rim. Um, and that's a Habitat story. So Habitat is saying, how do we help people realize their full potential? So um, uh, Andrew, thank you very much for asking.
Um, Thank you. Because, yeah, my being here means a lot to me. It's very personal. Thank you so much. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for that, Ian. And it's been great having you today. We really, really appreciate hearing from you and and uh, and hearing about this project. And I'm sure we'll we'll uh, we'll talk again before the project's completed. Thank you so very, very much. Well, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for what you do. Looking forward to finding a way to partner on this. It's really exciting. Thanks. Okay. Well, I may as well step in front of the camera. Thanks very much. That was lovely. Um, so I think next up we have Lyle with, uh, with our quote of the week. Go ahead, Lyle. Uh, thank you. Well, today's quote comes from uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Um, Zelensky, as we well know, has become a bit of a symbol of strength and resistance in the Ukraine. Huh. Um, everybody remembers him, I think, or, or knows him as a former comedian, but he's also a lawyer, a Russian trained lawyer, by the way. And uh, rather than fleeing, Zelensky stayed behind in Kyiv and uh, has posted a video of himself walking past the House of Chimeras, uh, which is a famous landmark in Kyiv and uh, also the residence of the uh, Ukrainian president. So Zelensky's urged his people to fight, to resist. And when the United States offered to airlift him to safety, he replied with the following. The fight is here. I need anti-tank ammo, not a ride. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, Lyle. And uh, with that, I guess that brings us to the uh, end of uh, a rotary meeting. If there's nothing else for the good of rotary, there is something else for the good of rotary. Just a, a very, very quick announcement. Oh, yeah, that here? camera is not open. Oh. You can right. see yourself okay. right, right there. Right here. Good. Okay, could I remind everyone that um, the Paul Harris Fellow Committee are looking for nominations. If you know of someone in the community, someone who gives of themselves, who got, goes above and beyond, please submit their name to either Renee or myself or Jason. Uh, we're looking for that very special person and we would like to honor them with a Paul Harris Fellow. So. The committee's meeting soon, so we only have uh, two or three more weeks before we can finalize this. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. And with that, if there's nothing else to the good of Rotary, call this meeting adjourned. Ooh.